Well, good morning, everyone, and greetings in the name of our Lord. It's a delight to be with you this morning. I'm John Howe, the senior pastor here at Lake of the Woods Church. My colleagues, Adam Colson and Jordan Metis, and uh, we give thanks for the opportunity to share this time with all of you. Today is Pentecost, one of the three greatest days in the church's calendar, Christmas, Easter, Pentecost. And I'll be preaching about that in a few minutes. But we have a lot of other things happening this week. And um, we're very excited that on Wednesday evening, we're going to begin to open up the church. Uh, We've been on lockdown since March. We're going to begin slowly and very carefully with a communion service on Wednesday evening. And all of the information about that is on our website. You need to register for that service if you'd like to attend. So please go to our website, lowchurch.org, and you can read my update. It's under uh, Letters to the Church, and you need to be on our mailing list. If you're not on the mailing list, you will not receive all the information that you need. So scroll down to the bottom of the homepage and get on our mailing list. We would love to have you join us Wednesday evening. Uh, We're doing an update. Yes, our, so our, our mission partner of, of this month is, is, as we talked last week about Navajo Nation, they happen to be our mission partner of the month. And so, uh, so this has been an exciting week. We see that Samaritan's Purse is headed to Navajo Nation and Doctors Without Borders is headed to Navajo Nation. So we're so thankful for these ministries and missions that are going to, to help the Navajo people. Uh, I want to encourage uh, our, our church congregation this week to uh, log on to our YouTube page and our our church website where you can see the interview uh, that I did with the pastors from Navajo Nation. I also want to encourage you to um, log on to our website and, and look at our newsletter where you'll find the colic for the month, our, our mission prayer for the Navajo people. So let's remember the Navajo people. Let's continue to pray for them. Let's ask that God would help uh, the, the, the doctors and the nurses to be able to treat the Navajo people and restore their health. And do get a copy of our uh, monthly newsletter, Cross Currents. It's available also uh, from the website. Jordan, you wanted to say a word about uh, 
the summer program? Yes, we, we want to kind of do a last call for VBS. VBS does not start this Monday, but the Monday after that. And the pickup for supplies will be this afternoon from 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. So you still have a chance to register and we can get you those supplies. So please do that. It's going to be a great time. We're all working together on those videos right now. And we're excited to, to welcome all campers for Happy Camper VBS. Happy campers. And I would like to give thanks to the crew. We've mentioned Kevin Paxton is doing most of the work on on these broadcasts, but there's a whole group of people with him. We have Dan and Jim and Biff and Henry up in the booth, and uh, these folks come week after week and make this possible. So thank you all very, very much. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth and he said, I become all things to all people that I might win some 
for the sake of the gospel. King Solomon said in Ecclesiastes that God makes everything appropriate, everything beautiful in his time. Why? Because he has also set eternity in their hearts. During this time of COVID-19, we have had to change the way we're doing ministry. And we've been talking about that the past few weeks in our services. We've been talking through our church on the move. We've been looking at our ministry of feeding the boys and girls and the families who are struggling right now. We've looked at the ways that Living Water Community Clinic has remained open and has changed its format some as to how we're treating patients. We've looked at the expansion with the new dental clinic that is opening. And we've looked even at the Good News Club and how we've changed that ministry. Through all of these things, we have had to adapt. We've had to learn new functions and we've had to become all things to all people that we might win some for the sake of the gospel. During this time, as we researched just how far our technology is being uh, downloaded and used, it's actually reaching into five different countries right now. Five different regions that are accessing our worship services, our devotions, our children's ministries. And we're seeing God do amazing things. We've received wonderful comments, not just from our church, but also from the community, from those watching it online and those who are accessing our broadcast through Channel 18. And we want to welcome those who are accessing our broadcast from other countries and from the community and from other states. And this week, we're going to begin our second series in Sacred Rest. We'll begin that Monday morning, and I look forward to meeting with you each day as we go through that series. But I also want to take a minute, and I want to talk about one of the other areas that we're adapting. We mentioned last week that our feeding ministry is going to vamp up starting tomorrow. Uh, We're going to increase our feeding ministry uh, to answer the need of the families here in Locust Grove that continue to need assistance with the feeding. As you know, Orange County Schools has changed their feeding ministry as well. They've uh, moved their feeding ministry to Orange High School, which has opened the door for us to do more right here in Locust Grove. And so, as I said last week, as long as there's a need and as long as we have the means, we'll continue doing our feeding ministry. But with that being said, we need more people that can come and help. More volunteers that can help pack as we have more boxes to pack. More individuals who are participating in dropping food off. And more individuals serving at our, our distribution centers right here at Lake of the Woods Church, as well as over at Route 20 at Living Water Community Clinic. Church family, God is making everything appropriate in his time. Why? Because he has set eternity in their hearts. Let's become all things to all people so that we can harvest that seed of eternity. We can reap that reward. We can see some during this time come into the wonderful gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for partnering. Thank you for praying. Thank you for volunteering your time. Thank you for donating. Good morning, everyone. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning to honor you, to acknowledge your work in creation and redemption and into eternity. We gather to worship you in spirit and in truth before the world as a testimony to your power and glory. We come with hearts of thanksgiving for your eternal love, your enduring grace, and your abundant mercy, and the assurance that as the things of this world change, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Father, help us to continually align our will with yours through prayer, through your word. Help us to be like trees planted by streams of water. Help us to not walk in the counsel of the wicked, but delight in your law and meditate on it night and day. May we continually love you, the Lord, with all our hearts and with all our souls and with all our might. Convict us to tell of your majesty to our children and talk of you when we sit in our homes, when we go, when we lie down and when we rise. 
Help us to bind your love and promises as a sign of your people and evidence of your unfailing love. Create in us pure hearts, O God, and renew a right spirit within us. Cast us not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from us, but restore to us the joy of our salvation and uphold us with a willing spirit. This morning, we thank you for the precious gift of your Holy Spirit, our comforter. May we continually be filled and led by your Holy Spirit, our source of revelation, wisdom, and power. Our source of gifting and service to you, our source of power to proclaim your good works. We praise you, Lord, for sending your Holy Spirit to convict those who do not believe and to give power to those who believe and are marked with a seal, a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are your possession, to the praise of your glory, Heavenly Father. We now offer up our own prayers of thanksgiving for the work of the Holy Spirit. Father, as your people, help us to seek justice and to love mercy. Give us strength and courage to call out injustice and to be angry when you are angry. Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And as we go out into the world, whether physically or electronically, help us to do so in the power of your Holy Spirit. We know that every encounter we have with others is an opportunity to be a vessel for you a means to express your love, your truth, and your power. So we ask your blessing on the missions and missionaries of the Lake of the Woods Church, those called specifically to go and to minister to others. Give them peace and joy in the work of spreading the gospel. We also pray for those continuing to worship under fear of persecution. Give them strength and peace, as well as a boldness to continue the kingdom work they've begun, bringing the message of salvation in Jesus Christ to those who need to hear it. So we now take a moment to pray for the missions, missionaries, and the persecuted church throughout the world. Lord of the universe, Father of all nations, we pray for our brothers and sisters in the Navajo Nation for jobs and employment that they may escape poverty, for wholesome activity that they may be liberated from addiction, and for hope that they may expect a new future. Give them the grace to invite Jesus into their lives. Lord, we continue to pray for those infected with COVID-19. We continue to seek your protection over the doctors, nurses, first responders, and essential employees, continually sacrificing their time and talents to care for their brothers and sisters. Give them strength, give them peace in the knowledge that after knowing and loving you, the greatest commandment is to love our neighbors as ourselves. Thank you for those who continue to serve during this pandemic. We now mention the names of those afflicted by COVID-19 and those serving on the front lines during this time. We also ask for peace among God's people in regard to how and when to reopen our country and our world. We pray that our president, vice president, governors, and local leaders would be found on their knees with hearts directed to you when facing the difficult task of easing the restrictions of quarantine. Lord, we now pray for those making decisions moving forward for our church, our country, and our world. And as we, the part of the body at the Lake of the Woods Church, begin to reopen our doors to celebrate the blessed gift of communion, We ask for your safekeeping. Give us prudence and discernment as we seek to honor you in remembering Christ's body broken and blood poured out for us. We ask your blessing over the service this coming Wednesday. And Father, this morning we ask your anointing and blessing upon Dr. Howe. May his joy be in you. His strength, uh, and give him strength as he brings forth the message you've laid on his heart. We as your people of the Lake of the Woods Church are so thankful for his service and dedication to your people. May Dr. Howe feel the great appreciation we have for him and his leadership, all in the power of your Holy Spirit. All these things we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, 
as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. In the fourth chapter of John's Gospel, we read that Jesus left Judea, where he had his encounter with Nicodemus, and headed back to Galilee. Judea was in the south, that's where Jerusalem is, and Galilee is up north near the Sea of Galilee. And to get there, he had to go through Samaria, which lay right in the middle. Ancient hostilities between Jews and Samaritans were so great that most Jews wanting to go to Galilee would avoid going through Samaria altogether. Rather than taking the direct route, they would cross over the Jordan River, go north on the other side through Gentile territory, and then cross back just just south of the Sea of Galilee. I won't even set foot in your territory. Jesus had no such reservations about dealing with Samaritans. In fact, I'm intrigued at how often he made them the heroes of his parables and teachings, most notably, of course, the good Samaritan. To most Jews, that was as much a self-contradiction as the good jihadist would be to us. But just about dead center in Samaria was a well given by the patriarch Jacob to his son Joseph. Jesus arrived there about noon and, tired from his journey, sat down for a rest. A Samaritan woman came to draw water from the well. That in itself was odd. People didn't come for water in the heat of the day. They came in the cool of the morning or the cool of the evening, but she was there at midday. As the story unfolds, we discover why that was so. This woman had had five husbands, And the man she was now living with, she wasn't married to. People considered her the town tramp, little better than a prostitute. And she had been shunned repeatedly. Rather than risking having that happen again, she went to the well when she thought no one else would be there. But Jesus engaged her. He asked her for a favor. Will you draw me a drink of water? She immediately recognized by his accent that he was a Jew, and she was shocked on three levels. First, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Second, he was a man and she a woman, and they hadn't been properly introduced. Uh, Most of us have no problem striking up a conversation with somebody we haven't previously met, but that was extremely unusual in that day. And third... By this point, she was used to being considered a social pariah. People just didn't deal with her. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? And Jesus said, well, if you knew who I am, you would have asked me for living water. Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But those who drink of the water that I give will never be thirsty. The water that I give will well up in them a spring of water gushing up to eternal life. What in the world was he talking about? If he has living water that will relieve thirst forever, why is he asking me to give him a drink? But she's hooked already. Oh, sir. Please give me that water that I may never thirst again or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus says, go call your husband. Oh, oh, sir, I have no husband. You know the story. It's one of our favorites. But I want us to notice several things. First, it's clear that Jesus had a goal in mind before he even begins this conversation. He wants this woman to see and acknowledge her need and the fact that she's been trying to meet it in all the wrong ways. She's gone from house to house, relationship to relationship, bed to bed, trying to find love, joy, inner satisfaction, and peace. And he knows she's not going to find it in physical relationships with men. 
She's going to find it in a spiritual relationship with God. And Jesus wants to introduce her to God. That's why he's come. But second, I'm intrigued that he begins by asking her to do him a favor. He wants to give her eternal life. But he begins by saying, you can do something for me. In effect, you are a person of worth, a person of value. When was the last time somebody treated her that way? Notice how often Jesus does that. He tells people, you can do something for me. He invites himself to dinner at the home of Zacchaeus, the corrupt tax collector. He accepts the ministrations of the woman of the streets at the home of the the, the proud Pharisee. He says, Mary of Bethany has done a good thing in anointing his feet with expensive ointment. And when he sends out the 70, he tells them to accept the hospitality of those they minister to. Sometimes recognizing that others have something to give us is an enormously important first step. Sometimes, apparently, it's more blessed to receive than to give. And third, don't you love his response to her statement that she has no husband? We don't hear tone of voice. We don't see facial expressions. But I can't picture Jesus railing at her. You immoral person, you liar. No, it's you've told me the truth. Um, Let's see, you've had five so far and one that's not quite there yet, but You've told me the truth. I see Jesus with a quizzical smile on his face, thinking, you dear, beloved fraud. Do you ever stop and wonder how Jesus knew that about her? Do you think he stopped at the courthouse on the way into town and checked the records? I think it was exercising one of the supernatural gifts of the Holy Spirit, what St. Paul calls a word of knowledge. God sometimes gives us knowledge of something we've never studied and couldn't otherwise know. And sometimes he'll allow us to see something about another person that can unlock the door to their heart, as it did for this woman. We're talking about Nathan confronting King David a couple of weeks ago. God gave the prophet Nathan a word of knowledge about David's adultery with Bathsheba. And when David was confronted with it, it broke his heart. God gave Jesus a word of knowledge about this woman. She has an inner thirst. And she's been trying to satisfy it in totally inappropriate ways. It's a thirst for God. And only he can satisfy it. The French philosopher Blaise Pascal said, There is a God-sized, God-shaped vacuum in the heart of every human being. And only God can fill it. Has he satisfied your thirst? Has he filled that vacuum in your soul? You know, we're surrounded by people who are literally dying of thirst for God. They may not know it. They may vociferously deny it. But that's their true condition. Dying of thirst for God. When Jesus revealed to this woman who he is, the Messiah, she not only gulped down that living water herself, she ran back to town to tell others, the very people she was trying to avoid, come meet a man who told me everything I ever did. Well, he didn't. He just told her the most important thing about herself And she was so deeply touched by the way he did it that she became, in effect, the first evangelist to the Samaritans. Bishop Festo Kavengeri of Uganda was nicknamed the world's most joyful Christian. Wouldn't you like to have that said of you? He just exuded the love and life and laughter of God. But before he was ordained, before he was even a Christian, he was a school teacher. And he was converted through the witness of some of his students. Many of them came from extremely poor, poor backgrounds, but they had a zest for life 
that he knew he lacked. And finally, he asked some of them about it. Mr. Covengery, they said, Jesus satisfies. Yesu Atosha in Swahili. Are, are you satisfied? He couldn't get past that question. And he finally asked Jesus to become his Savior and Lord. Well, fast forward to John chapter 7, where we read that Jesus is back in Jerusalem at the Feast of Tabernacles, is sometimes called the Feast of Booths. That's the celebration of the autumn harvest. And it's called Tabernacles or Booths because the Jews were instructed to live for seven days outside their homes in temporary shelters. If you visit the Holy Land today during the Feast of Tabernacles, you'll see little temporary booths everywhere. Why were they to do this? To remind themselves of their time in the wilderness, the 40 years between leaving Egypt and getting into the promised land, that was a time when there were no autumn harvests. There were no crops. God sent manna every day from heaven, and it sustained, but it didn't really satisfy. They spent a lot of time complaining about it. And God said, I want you to remind yourselves of my faithful provision during all those 40 years. And now that you have this harvest, remember there was a time when you didn't. And in Jesus' day, they celebrated tabernacles with a fascinating ceremony. Every day for a week, the high priest would lead a procession from the pool of Siloam to the temple, carrying a great golden pitcher of water. And he would lead the procession around the altar one time. On the seventh day, he would circle the altar seven times, reminiscent of Joshua circling the city of Jericho before the walls came a-tumbling down. And then he would pour the water out all over the altar. Why did he do that? Two reasons. One looked back and one looked forward. Looking back, that ceremony was also a reminder of the wilderness wandering, a time when God provided not only manna, but also water from the rock in a dry and thirsty desert. Looking forward, it anticipated the fulfillment of God's promise in the book of Joel that when the Messiah comes, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. Even upon the male and female servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. The action of the high priest said, God poured out water in the wilderness for his people to drink. And when the Messiah comes, he's going to pour out his spirit just as I've poured out this water on the altar today. John tells us that it was on the seventh day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the great day, when the high priest had just completed this ceremony, surrounded by thousands of pilgrims who were there for the Feast of Tabernacles. You can just hear them shouting and cheering and applauding in anticipation of God pouring out his spirit. It was at that moment that Jesus cried out in a loud voice. Do you, you see that? You see what he's just done? That's about me. I've come to fulfill that promise. I'm the one because of whom God is going to pour out his spirit. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me, and let whoever believes in me drink. As the scripture has said, out of his heart, out of her heart, shall flow rivers of living water. And John adds this editorial comment. Now this he said about the Holy Spirit, whom believers in Jesus were to receive. For as yet he had not been given in this way, because Jesus was not yet glorified. So do you see the connection? What Jesus offered the woman at the well, a spring of water gushing up to eternal life, he turned into a promise for all believers who put their trust in him. Rivers of living water. Your thirst will be so fully assuaged that you won't be able to keep it to yourself. It will flow from you 
to quench the thirst of others. Just as this woman's thirst was so wonderfully quenched that she couldn't keep it to herself, so Jesus said, that will be true for all who believe in me. Today is Pentecost Sunday, and it was on the first Pentecost that this promise began to be fulfilled. Let's put it in context. Jesus rose from the dead 50 days earlier. He had appeared to various individuals and groups on a road, in a room, on a beach, to Mary Magdalene, to Cleopas and his friend, to Peter, to his own brother James, to the ten, then to the eleven, and to more than 500 people at one time. He had opened their understanding of scriptures that had never made sense previously. And finally, he said, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them everything I've taught you. And he said, you shall be my witnesses here in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. But he said, not quite yet. Wait here in Jerusalem until I send upon you what my father promised. Wait until you have been clothed with power from on high. And then he ascended into heaven. That was 40 days after the resurrection. The waiting turned out to be another 10 days. And I'm reading from Acts chapter 2. They were all together in one place, about 120 of them. The 12, Matthias having been appointed to take Judas' place, Jesus' mother, Mary, and it says his brothers were among them as well. We know Jesus had four brothers who didn't believe in him prior to the resurrection. And we know that Jesus met personally with James, the eldest brother, who was so thoroughly converted that he became the leader of the Jerusalem church. We don't know the specifics of the others, but evidently at least some of them also became believers. And they were all together waiting because he told them to. It's usually said that they were in the upper room where they had shared the Last Supper with Jesus. I think that is highly unlikely. The last sentence of Luke's gospel says that during this strange time of waiting, they were continually in the temple blessing God. The day of Pentecost was one of the three great festivals of the Jews. For every able-bodied man, it was a command performance. You need to be at the feast. You need to be in the temple on Pentecost. And as many of them as could do so, brought their families with them. So if they were in the temple every day, blessing God, and they're specifically commanded to be in the temple on the day of Pentecost, where do you think they were when God poured out his spirit? I think they were in the temple, probably in Solomon's portico, where Jesus used to meet with them. And suddenly, from heaven, there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Luke tells us there were pilgrims from at least 16 countries, all of them expatriate Jews, And suddenly, they heard this group of 120 Christians praising God in their many different languages. It says they were amazed and perplexed, and they asked, what does this mean? Peter stood up and proclaimed in a loud voice, this is what the prophet Joel promised. In the last days, God declares, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, your sons, your daughters, your young men, your old men, even upon the men servants and maid servants in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This is what Joel promised. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. This is what Jeremiah promised. 
Behold, the days are surely coming when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. I will put my law within them and I will be their God and they shall be my people and they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord. This is what was prefigured in the pouring out of water in the desert during the time of the Exodus. This is what Jesus offered the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well, living water, gushing up to eternal life. This is what he offered to all who believe at the Feast of Tabernacles, streams of living water, satisfying your thirst and flowing forth to quench the thirst of others. This is what fills the God-sized, God-shaped vacuum in the heart of everyone. This is what constitutes the secret of victorious Christian living, Not I, but Christ living in me by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what provides the basis of all Christian ministry. Not our wisdom, our insight, but the anointing, the empowering, the gifting, the enabling. With words of wisdom and knowledge, gifts of faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment, tongues, interpretation, and the list goes on and on. This is what produces the fruit of the Spirit in the lives of Jesus' followers. All those wonderful character traits of Jesus himself. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity. This is what enables us to become little Christs. Men and women, boys and girls, in whom the Lord Jesus lives. He lives out his life in the blessing of others by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the key to everything. St. Paul wrote to the Ephesians, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You want to know what the will of the Lord is? This is it. Be filled with the Spirit. And be filled and going on, go on being filled. It's continuous present tense. The Holy Spirit is to Christians what gasoline is to an automobile. Without gas, your car can only go downhill. Without the Spirit of God welling up inside us day by day, moment by moment, gushing up to eternal life, we can only run downhill. Have you been filled with the Spirit? Are you being filled with the Spirit? You say, how does that happen? How do we get filled and refilled? By asking and receiving. Jesus said, if you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Father, I can't do this by myself. You were never intended to. Come to me and drink. As the psalmist put it, open your mouth wide and I will fill it. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Ask him. Let this be your feast of Pentecost.
So may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon you and give you his peace this day of Pentecost and forever. Amen.